this was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody else, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face, they basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow this head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. If you want more shows every week on Thursdays, we release a bonus episode to members only to the website. So if you want to hear those shows, all past shows and all future shows, go ahead and become a member to the website today. Just go to the confessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button and you'll be set and good to go. Now, this week we have a little bit of a different show. We're going to be starting out with MJ Benias and he is somebody who writes for Vice and he did an article about the Skinwalker Ranch. He actually got a chance to go there and search it himself. So we talked to MJ for about 40 minutes and to be honest with you, I want wasn't sure what I was going to do with the second half of the show because I always try to put out at least an hour for you guys. And I was thinking about talking about the basically the new Roswell that we're experiencing and not a lot of people are talking about it. And maybe I'll go into it on another episode, but I think there was something a little bit more pressing to talk about this week. And so after MJ, we're going to be transitioning into a recorded version of what I did yesterday on my Instagram live. I went live and I just started talking to the people tuning in about uh, what's happening in this country. And You know, I think we're facing a time where one day we're going to have to look at our grandchildren and they're going to ask, what did you do and where were you? And we're going to have to answer for that. And so underneath that idea, I operate and do things knowing that I'm not working for today, but I'm working for tomorrow. And I have grandchildren coming down the pike. They're going to ask me, Grandpa, what did you do? What did you say? This isn't the 60s anymore. Everything is recorded. They're going to know. I want to do the right thing now for future generations. And so I had to do what I had to do. And so I recorded that audio and I'm putting it on the second half of this show. Hopefully you guys enjoy it. Hopefully you guys gain from it. And hopefully it encourages you to move forward in unity. I love you guys. Let's get to the show. Okay, today we got a great guy coming on, MJ Benias. How you doing? 
I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, man. So uh, I came across an article recently with you uh, as the author, and it was about Skinwalker Ranch. And actually, the article is called Inside Skinwalker Ranch, a Paranormal Hotbed of UFO UFO Research. And uh, you're a writer for Vice, right? Vice.com. Yes. Yeah, I write for Vice as well as Popular Mechanics. How, How did you get involved with Vice to start things off here? Sure. Um, I've been doing writing concerning sort of UFO stuff for for a while now, um, probably five years, maybe four or five years. Um, and I wrote for some some smaller publications, Mysterious Universe, um, my own blog, that type of thing. Um, but I have to be honest, I had been pitching to Vice and other places for a really long time, trying to get some more UFO content out, uh, just sort of more mainstream audiences. And it happened... Um, when the Navy came out and said, um, you know, we have this UFO footage and it's and it's, um, you know, shows some weird stuff. And the Navy was making comments about how it's, you know, legitimately a UAP, stuff like that. Um, and I just pitched to Vice at the right time. Uh, and they were like, yeah, actually, you know what? Um, can you do this for us? And it, one article became two, two became three. And then um, I now sort of have a mother UFO column, I guess, on uh, on Vice. So that's how it began. And, and there's there's a lot of desire for UFO content. Um, uh, so so I think it just kind of all was was pretty fortuitous for me. Yeah, you know, uh, UFO content is very, uh, it, it, it tracks a lot of people. And, uh, you know, having v- Vice actually going through the process of bringing you on and to have you write things like that, I think is a big step for them. I mean, uh, it, it's it's really good content. And I, I think people under, people like Vice, like these organizations like Vice, these bigger organizations, they, I think, underestimate how many people out there are very interested in such topics. And uh, I I hear it all the time when I tell people about what I do and stuff. They're stunned that I have people that actually listen to what I do. And it's just because people who aren't in these types of communities tend not to realize how big these communities are. I mean, there's a lot of people interested in this stuff. Uh, when When did you get involved as far as your interest goes with this kind of stuff? Um, well, when I was in university, my coursework was predominantly in like culture, culture studies and and critical theory and stuff like that. So really looking at, at culture and communities and how ideas form around them. Um, and and I never really, I mean, I was, you know, growing up as a kid, I was into sci-fi and fantasy and that kind of stuff. So I always had sort of a nerdy side. Um, but it was after university, uh, I became an educator and, and, um, a friend of mine who's a, a local where I live, his name's Chris Rutkowski. He's written a lot about UFOs in Canada, um, where I'm from. He, you know, kind of said, listen, you should kind of get involved. This is a pretty cool subculture. I think you'd like studying it. Um, and I got in kind of purely for academic reasons, just to kind of look at the, the community of people who are into UFOs, who experience UFOs, who investigate UFOs. Um, and very quickly, I learned I knew nothing. Um, so I started reading a lot of books, started interviewing a lot of people. I became a MUFON field investigator for a couple of years just to kind of get the the different perspectives and, and kind of get my feet sort of wet in, in regards to, to the UFO side of things. And uh, it really just blossomed into a, a, a larger research writing project. Um, and I've been doing it now for about seven years. Um, and, and, and that's sort of how it all began. Yeah, you know, and... I didn't realize, you know, about all your extensive writing history and stuff. And I had, you know, when I was preparing for this interview, came across uh, a book that you had published called The UFO People, A Curious Culture, which kind of just falls in line with what you just said about how you were just really looking into a lot of this different stuff that for educational purposes. Uh, what's this book about? Um, the book was my attempt to originally... Um, paint a picture of what the UFO subculture was. So I went into it, um, with like significant hubris and, and said to myself, yeah, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to nail the UFO subculture. I'm going to get it. So I have, I'm going to build a roadmap for, for other researchers to have a place to kind of go to when we, when we think about the UFO subculture. Um, and as I started researching for the book, um, I realized that like there was zero chance anyone can make sense of it. Um, it's a very, very complicated subculture um, because it's not just about UFOs. It's about conspiracy culture. It's about paranormal culture. There's Bigfoot, uh, cryptozoology, whatever, um, monsters of, of various sorts. So you have this really, really complicated group of people who believe a whole bunch of different things. They believe in some aspects. They don't believe in others. Um, you know, so the book 
initially was to try to piece together the subculture and what it very quickly became rather was a project on how to how do we talk about ufos and how do we talk about the ufo subculture in relation to mainstream culture um and what i argue in the book is is you really really can't um mainstream culture hinges upon ufo culture simply because of how ufos and and the paranormal have sort of propagated mainstream culture through film television you know other media sources um and how the mainstream kind of propagates itself through the ufo subculture and people who engage in ufos often kind of rely on mainstream tropes to to tell sometimes their stories um so so it it became sort of this realization that the ufo subculture is this sort of symbiotic system that exists with mainstream culture i guess um and and ultimately um creates a lot of problems for 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 kind of both worlds um the U- ufos and and the ufo subculture really create a lot of problems for mainstream culture um cult like from all cultural paradigms from like capitalism to gender to race to even stuff like sovereignty of nations um so that's what the book kind of paints this this how the ufo world kind of problematizes um mainstream the mainstream community but on the flip side, how mainstream culture really messes with the UFO subculture and how a lot of the things people are seeing are very much related to mainstream culture and, and how history has gone and, and, and how technology has evolved over time. So um, I guess to really simplify it, we, we, UFOs and, and mainstream cultures and all that were kind of ghosts in each other's machine. Um, and, and that's what the book is kind of in a nutshell really about. Um, it's got lots of interviews, lots of interesting stories. So um, I really would recommend people go check it out. Yeah, absolutely. And you can check it out on Amazon. Just go to Amazon and search for it, the UFO people and curious culture. And I'll tell you, you know, you kind of hit it right on the head there, because when you're talking about this kind of stuff, uh, when I first got into it, and I first started looking into this stuff, probably I'd say 2015, 2014, uh, it was something that I went into and I was really fascinated by this idea of Bigfoot. And so I really kind of got jumped into it with that. And I was like, are people really seeing this thing? But the more I was involved in these communities, the more I realized that it's really hard to peg down and define what everybody's about. And there's not a whole lot that everybody can agree on. Uh, Everybody has their own theories, their own philosophies. And I always say it on my show that I think a big part of it is people carry in their own worldviews into these experiences that they have, or when they're looking into these topics and stuff, everybody comes from different parts of life. And I think their theologies and their worldviews really do shape and mold how they view these things. And I always use the example of, you know, if you had an atheist and a priest in the same room and they experienced a paranormal experience, they'd walk out of that room describing something very different because they have different worldviews going into that experience that that they saw that experience through. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things where I just think that uh, we have a, a very big world, lots of people in it, and lots of people with different ideas. And so when you're trying to peg down these kind of different communities and stuff, it's really hard and they bleed together. There, there's a lot of people that, you know, believe that, you know, UFOs are from the other worlds through aliens, but also that Bigfoot is an alien. And so it's yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just, it really bleeds all together and stuff. Uh, but I think it's really fascinating. I really think it's cool that you're a writer. Uh, I, I wish I could write. I, I don't. I'm not a good writer. So I love talking to guys who do it for a living and professionally. Now, uh, to this Vice article, how did this whole thing start for you? Now, you actually went to Skinwalker Ranch. And this I was telling you earlier before we started recording that uh, when this article was released, it was the same week that I released uh, two Skinwalker episodes. And one was uh, with an interview, got a, a guy named Ryan Burns, and he actually owns a property that butts up to Skinwalker Ranch. And so I had him on, and he was talking about his property and you know the things that they experienced there. But it's really hard to get onto Skinwalker Ranch. How did this whole thing unfold for you? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's quite the story. Um, and, and, and some of it I can tell and some of it just because of various like contracts I have with Vice and, and, and stuff like that. I, I have to kind of be cautious. Um, but it, it, it began probably eight months ago or so, maybe a little, little longer. Um, the, you know, I, I was sort of put in contact with, with the owner of the ranch um, and we, we, you know, I guess got to talking, um, I guess it's kind of the best way to put it. Um, and 
we we decided uh, you know it would be interesting to do uh, a story because no one really knows what's what's going on 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 the ranch um the the most recent time was i think in 20 it was 2018 or 2016 when when jeremy corbell uh, and george knapp went on the ranch to film the documentary hunt for the skinwalker but i, I think the, the biggest problem with that documentary was there was not a lot of new information um it was all uh, a sort of retelling of of the the book hunt for the skinwalker from early 2000s so uh, you know i i spoke with the owner and i said you know i think people really would like to know the work you're doing. Um, and I think it's, you know, I get that there's some secrecy and, and some security, uh, stuff that's involved, but you know, what's going on with the ranch and um, people want to know. Um, and, and, and he thought it was a good idea. And he said, well, you know, let's, let's do an article, you know, you come on the ranch and you tell people what you see. Um, and that's kind of how it began. Um, we, we, it took us about six months or so to, to kind of find a time that worked for everybody. Um, and, and eventually, um, I got to fly out, went to Utah, um, you know, got to hang out with the owner for a few days, went to the ranch, um, and just met the team on the ranch and, and, and got to kind of see the science that they're doing, which was, which was kind of cool. Oh yeah, absolutely. When you wrote this article, I, I was reading about this, uh, command center that they have and I was like, wow, this is really cool because, uh, I wasn't expecting such, uh, a high technology facility that they have operating there because previous owners, yeah, I, and like you said in the article, uh, when it comes to the Skinwalker, there are so many different variations of the story. It's hard to figure out what's what. And when it comes to the property, it's the same thing. Like I've heard so many different types of things and with the different owners, but these owners apparently are taking a very scientific approach. Yeah, he the, the current owner as well as his science team and, and the rest are, are, are fairly... You know, they, they're convinced there's something sort of anomalous occurring on the ranch. Um, they, they would say they have enough evidence to say, listen, you know, we think something weird is happening. Um, but their project is not to go out and try and prove that it's aliens or it's um, interdimensional entities or it's skinwalkers. Um, their project is to simply observe the ranch. Um, they've spent their their time, their their money, um, as well as as sort of their 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 efforts um, to catalog the ranch, um, and, and the weird stuff that happens, it's purely observational at this point. Um, and they would say, listen, we don't have enough data to come to any conclusions, um, whether it's paranormal or, or whatever. Um, it may not even be paranormal. You know, one of the options is this is just some sort of odd natural phenomena we just don't know about yet. It's just literally laws of physics we have yet to figure out. Um, so, so they're kind of approaching it from a very open, um, yet, obviously, you know, skeptical and critical standpoint, um, no one is going to say on that ranch that it's that it's aliens or anything. They they are basically just saying, listen, we think there's weird stuff. We're just going to hit record and see what happens. Um, and that's basically what they're doing. Um, and their their data platforms aren't just video. Um, they have, you know constant emf and, and radio signal detection they're detecting aircraft over over the the ranch at all times so they can track you know what planes are in the sky um they're they're looking at you know tectonic vibrations underneath the ranch they're looking at infrasonic sounds a sound that we can't hear that's kind of moving through the ranch um they're looking at like transient magnetic fields like it, it's everything like they have literally said you know if something moves on this ranch, we are going to capture it. Um, and that's the project, right? To see how many times they can capture things kind of occurring on the ranch. Yeah, well, I think that's really cool. And uh, you mentioned about the, you know, physics of things. And I think that the more we learn about quantum physics, I think the more maybe normalized this idea of paranormal might become because it seems like on a quantum level, there are things going on that we have a really hard time understanding. And uh, maybe this location is something where on a, on a qu the quantum level is starting to peak through where we are able to observe it. And uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but I try to understand quantum physics as much as possible. And uh, it just seems to me the more we learn about quantum physics, it might start explaining some of the experiences and things we observe on the paranormal level. Um, what what are your thoughts about the whole idea of the United States government being involved in this property? Um, well, you know, at this point, um, 
you know, the, the property is privately owned. Um, we know that previous to 2016, um, in, I think it ended in 2012, there was a project called the, uh, the OSAP project is advanced aerospace weapons system, something like that. Like I always forget the acronym, the advanced aerospace weapons systems program or something that effect. Um, and it was a, a DOD DIA project. Um, and it was run through Bigelow aerospace. Um, and they were the ones who won the contract and they were given money to kind of explore various ufological and paranormal phenomena. Um, and Skinwalker ranch was one of the locations that, um, bass or Bigelow aerospace was, was involved in, um, you know, so we know that that there has been government interest. Um, you know, I suspect that there is still some government interest. The government isn't involved in the ranch in the sense that they have people there working. Um, but I do believe that that they are probably still monitoring and they're still engaging in in, in dialogue uh, with probably the current owners because they did have you know some some research sort of money spent on the ranch. I'm sure they're still kind of curious um, to see if it was money well spent. Um, so yeah, there, there is some government interest definitely in the ranch. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, convinced it's, it's like, you know, clandestine or anything. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, apparently weird stuff happens and, and, um, you know, I wrote an article a couple days ago, you know, Louis Elizondo told me in, in an interview, he says, you know, it's kind of, the duty of the government to understand what's going on in its own airspace and its own territory. So if there's weird stuff happening somewhere in America, the American government's going to want to know and potentially get a handle on, on what that is. Yeah, it only makes sense. And I absolutely understand that. And I, I, when I found out that the government was involved with the property at all, I was really surprised and, you know, kind of on on my side of things kind of validates the interest that I have in it. If the government's willing to be interested in it, then, you know, okay, then it's okay to be interested in this thing because maybe I'm not just chasing a golden egg. Uh, yeah. Maybe I am. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, I've always been very fascinated by this property. And uh, just the fact that the government is involved in it is pretty interesting to me. Now, uh, the guys that were kind of escorting you around, I know it was the owner and, and I understand that his privacy needs to remain um, private. Uh, but there were other people that weren't so private in the article. Uh, I, th I think one guy's name was Eric uh, and another guy's huh? name was... Um Oh, uh, I'm drawing a blank now, but there was a couple of guys that were in the command center with you and uh, telling you different experiences that they've had. And uh, if, if you could maybe share with the audience some of these things that these guys that work the property have relayed to you as things that, you know, maybe they didn't say it was, you know, paranormal or UFO or aliens or anything like that, but maybe they just found it odd. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, for the bulk of the time I was there, I was I was hanging out with um, the the security the head of security there, his name's Bryant Arnold. Um, he goes by dragon. Um, it's a bit of a joke, but, um, you know, he, it, it, they call him that sometimes cause he's, he kind of looks mean and scary. <laughs> um, but he's a really nice guy. Um, and then Tom Winterton, who is sort of the superintendent, he's the, the guy who, you know, if anything breaks down or whatever, he's the guy who's fixing it. Um, so that's sort of his gig. And, and we were, you know, going around the ranch, we were driving around and, and just, they were taking me on a big tour and, and showing me everything. And, um, you know, these guys have, have definitely had some interesting experiences. Um, you know, Tom Winterton, sort of the most, most notably, um, he, he was injured allegedly, um, on the ranch, um, for, for digging. Um, the, the story goes that you're not supposed to dig on the ranch because if you do, you're sort of disturbing whatever's there. Um, and, and he believes that, um, he was doing some, some digging on the ranch, uh, to, to move some earth. Um, they're basically trying to build a path. That's really what they were doing. Um, and he was on a skid steer and, um, you know, he, he started kind of getting this headache. Um, so he, he gets out and he, you know, heads home, not feeling so great. And basically what happened was his brain started to swell and then his, his scalp started to separate from his skull. Um, and, and it was quite dramatic. I got to see some of the, the, the scans, the MRI scans and the pictures. I mean, you know, the guy's head was literally like bubbling out. Um, and he says, you know, it, it started because I was digging on the ranch. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure totally if I can sort of 
say that, you know, scientifically or with any evidence. Um, but it, it is a compelling story. I did get to see some of the medical records. You know, a lot of the test results were inconclusive for the, the usual stuff that, that causes such an injury. Um, so, you know, as, as a journalist, I have to kind of err on the side of, of evidence and caution all the time. But uh, some of the evidence, you know, you're like, well, like, listen, you know, the, it, usually this is caused by a bacterial infection. There's no bacteria. So that's an interesting test result um, that was run at the hospital, for example. Um, so maybe he was injured, right, by the ranch. Um, but he's had quite a few experiences. Um, but he's the guy who's always out there, you know, working um, and, and disturbing stuff. Um, uh, on the flip side, the security guard, um, had apparently quite a dramatic experience. Um, cur- or over the summer, um, history channel was there, uh, a film team was there sort of doing some filming on the ranch. And, um, um I guess the, uh, the story goes that, that something happened and, and multiple people, including the camera guys who are working the show sort of were, were stunned to see something quite sort of odd in the sky. Um, and I guess there's, there's going to be a whole bunch of evidence that's going to come forward, um, kind of regarding this, um, where you had sort of five or six witnesses see something, um, as well as, you know, all of the other sensor platforms potentially, you know, um, alerting the rest of the ranch team that something weird was happening. Um, so yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot of stories right on the ranch and, and, um, the guys there have definitely experienced their fair share of weirdness, um, being on the property. Oh yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I can't imagine even just the feeling of your brain swelling, but then like the skin separating from the skull and like, and having the medical, you know, proof to document that is, is, you know, fascinating to me. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, I'm really interested in seeing this TV show that the History Channel is doing because the audience knows I don't I don't watch TV and there's a lot of times I have guests on the show that say, hey, "Have you ever seen the movie?" I'm like, "Nope, I haven't seen the movie. <laughs> like, I don't watch <laughs> I don't watch TV. I don't watch movies a whole lot. I'm a very busy guy. I'm very very focused on what I do. And uh, but this is one TV show that when I saw it was coming out, I am going to be making time to watch it and I'm very interested to see what you just described. Um, now, this let me ask you this. Had, as far as you know, has there ever been any documentation such as what the History Channel is doing before? I know what you have like documentaries like uh, that we just came out, you know, what, 2016 or something. But uh, to the extent of doing an actual season on TV or maybe multiple seasons, has there ever been anything done like that before? Do you know? For, for Skinwalker Ranch? Yeah. No, never. No, this is the, the first time. Um Skinwalker Ranch for, you know, before Bigelow bought the ranch in 1996, um, it, it was, it wasn't even, it, the, Skinwalker Ranch is really a new, I guess, a new thing. Um, the, the Uinta Basin, um, where Skinwalker is located is sort of smack dab in the middle of it, actually. Um, it's really like, like when you look at a map of Utah and then you look at a map of the Uinta Basin in Utah, um, there's like literally like if you put your finger right in the middle of the basin, Skinwalker Ranch is, is literally there. Um, there's been a lot of stories out of the Uinta Basin of, of a lot of weird paranormal encounters for a while, um, probably a century, maybe a little more. So we do have newspaper articles, for example, from, you know, the 1920s and and, and whatever of, of people seeing odd lights in the sky or, or, or strange happenings and, and that type of thing, um, you know, in into the 19 sort of 50s, 40s, 50s, you know, there's a lot of reports of strange creatures. Um, you know, I guess you could sort of say they're sort of werewolf like creatures, um, you know, that that, you know, you know, somebody's walking and they see this, this wolf kind of stand upright and run away, that type of stuff. Um, and there's a book about it, um, by, uh, two gentlemen named Dr. Frank Salisbury and, and, uh, Joseph Hicks. I can't remember the book off the top of my head, but it's basically cataloging the weirdness of, of the Uinta Basin. Really, it, it becomes the Skinwalker Ranch after Robert Bigelow buys it in in ninety six. Um, the family that owned it previously were the Sherman family. They were ranchers, and the ranch is a working ranch, so they do raise cattle on it. Um, and and their intention Still was to raise cattle. They're, like they're raising cattle, yeah, they actually do currently. Um, they do keep cows there over the summer. Um, they don't. Um, like it's not, it's just a ranch though. So, so they've made arrangements with some local ranchers to basically provide them land for their cows. 
Um, and, and, and those ranchers will, will use the land, right? The cows live on the land and, and basically the cows are then transported away during the winter. And usually it's probably for slaughter, right? I mean, it is a ranch after all for cows. Um, but, um, you know, obviously the condition that, that, that I guess is, is set up, um, is, you know, the cows live on the ranch. Um, but they're actually a useful kind of tool, um, in the sense that, you know, cows will often react to things, um, that, that humans won't necessarily react to because we just don't see it or smell it or sense it. Um, so the cows are, are, are acutely called biosensors um, because that's literally what they do. When the cows are freaking out, something's around, right? Um, so they often use the cows in this sort of way. Um, so I guess as a rancher, if you if, you, if you're cows on Skinwalker Ranch, you kind of have to be aware that, you know, <laughs> you might lose one to a werewolf every once in a while, but um, <laughs> not, that's just a joke. But the Sherman family was ranching um, and, they experience a lot of cattle mutilations, a lot of weird encounters with strange, you know, creatures, you know, UFO type phenomena, whatever. Um, and it caught the attention. It, it made news headlines and it caught the attention of Robert Bigelow, who bought the ranch from them in 96. Um, and that's kind of when the whole government interest began into the 2000s. So, um, yeah, it's 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 had a long weird history but it wasn't until the book hunt for the skinwalker came out that skinwalker ranch really was known as skinwalker ranch it was called the sherman ranch um for a while there was um the ridge that runs through the ranch is sort of a big mesa it's called um skinwalker ridge now but it used to be called werewolf ridge so the skinwalker thing's kind of a new phenomena in in the sense of of its name um but it, it it doesn't sort of discount the fact that stories have been reported in the basin and in the area for a very long time. Um, you know, so you just kind of the, the history part is is kind of it's the devil in the details. Right. But um, it, it's it's a very interesting place. And, and I have to say, like, it's beautiful. Like, it's it's a beautiful piece of land. It's 512 acres. And it's like like I, I said in the article, all I wanted to do was camp. Like I could grab a backpack and just go camping for for a week out there and just explore. Um, it's it's truly a beautiful place. That's really interesting. That it was called Werewolf Ridge at one time. I mean, because even even that, though, I mean, it, it, if you take, you know, oral tradition, how p- things get names and stuff. I mean, skinwalkers supposedly can turn into like a half u- human, half wolf type creature. And there's a lot of people saying that, you know, they experience such things on skin. Well, I shouldn't say a lot of people, but there's a lot of stories of people experiencing uh, such mm-hmm. stories on Skinwalker Ranch. And it just makes you wonder if, you know, skinwalker being more of a modern term. Uh, but ba- even back then they were naming things after they saw or whatever, but it's very curious. I find. Yeah. Well, yeah. Skinwalker is a, a Navajo term for a sort of shape shifter, um, uh, that can, yeah, it, it can sort of shape shift into whatever it can have the skin of. So it's a sort of supernatural entity. Um, and, and again, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure how the, the connection was made to call it Skinwalker Ranch. I think there's just kind of been some stories thrown, thrown around that, um, there's a sort of Navajo curse in the area. Um, and, and the curse was a skinwalker and that's, what's kind of living there. Um, again, you know, historically really tough to check. Um, there's, there's been, I've, a lot of people I spoke to sort of from the, the local, uh, Ute tribe there, the indigenous group that lives there, the Ute tribe, they sort of never really heard the story before. And then some other people in the area were like, oh yeah, no, I've heard that story. So, you know, again, as, as someone who has to kind of always err on the side of, of, you know, maybe being more critical, um, I'm not too sure you know, the, the history of the skinwalker term in, 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 in this ranch. Um, but like I said, it doesn't discount the fact that people have seen strange things there. So, um, you know, I want to kind of separate the two ideas almost, um, the name is just the name. Um, let's not put too much weight in that. I think what's more interesting is, is the events that occur on the ranch. Yeah, you know, I remember you saying that in the article that you were talking to that one lady and when you brought it up, she kind of laughed and she said she never heard of it. Uh, and yeah. I wanted to ask you, like, you know, because to me, as somebody, I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, so I'm on the other side of the, the, the country, but I've heard about this so much that did you, were you ever caught off guard by that? I mean, as as in like, did you think that maybe she was just kind of putting on a front that she has heard about, but she doesn't want to talk about it because, of, you know, the Native Americans, you know, legend that, you know, you're not supposed to talk about these things or else it could attract their attention? You know, it, it, it could have been. Um, she was really... Um she was great. I mean, we spoke on the phone for, for, I don't know, probably half an hour. Um, and she said, you know, the one thing that she really wanted to clarify, um, and I, and I kind of put this in the article, but, um, you know, she said that she represents the Ute tribe, 
um, on an administrative level, right? So she's their cultural sort of liaison with the American government. Um, so if anything's going, you know, on with, with, you know, cultural land or, or whatever, or there's, you know, again, just disputes of some sort, she's the one who deals with that. So she said, you know, I represent the Ute, um, on an administrative front, I don't really represent like individual stories or, or sort of local stories or, or, or mythology. So she, she said, she sort of caveated it by saying, you know, listen, I've never heard of this sort of skinwalker thing. She says, I know it's a Navajo thing. Like I've heard of skinwalkers, but I never knew that, that this story existed in the basin. And in fact, she sort of pointed out, you know, Navajo never lived in the Uinta basin. Navajo land is like 400 miles to the South. Um, so, so she said, you know, I would be surprised if the Navajo would curse the Uinta Basin simply because they never, like, they never lived there. There would be no Navajo to curse it. Um, but she said, you know, that still doesn't discount the fact that you have Ute who live in the Uinta Basin who would say, you know, my great grandfather's great grandfather tells a story and there were Navajo here or there was a curse put on the land or, or whatever. So she would kind of be like, listen, just because you know, we don't have historical records of, of Navajo living in the Uinta Basin. It doesn't mean that there weren't maybe moments where they did and it just never made it into sort of the, the broader history. Um, there could be these kind of local um, sort of oral traditions that exist. So so she was, again, she kind of caveated her statement, but she did burst out laughing, which was thoroughly enjoyable because I'm sitting here being like, <laughs> yeah, I want to ask you about this kind of curse and she just guffaws into the phone. Um, but you know, it was it was an uh, interesting moment because I had always kind of just assumed that, yeah, I guess Navajo did live here because there is this curse. And, you know, according to the Ute and their administrative end, um, there's no historical record of that. Um, but on, on the flip side, when I spoke with the Navajo, um, you know, they were saying, yeah, you know, we, we don't really know if there were Navajo in the basin. Um, the, the Navajo spokesperson, she was the cultural liaison as well. The PR person, she said, um, you know, we, we do know there's some, you know, conflict between the Navajo and the Ute. There always has been some land conflict, especially sort of in and around Utah. Um, and she said, you know, is it outside the realm of possibility that, if there was some land conflict centuries ago that, you know, and there was a group of Navajo involved, is it out of the realm of possibility that they would curse the land? No, it's a, it's something we, you know, we used to do is kind of how she worded it and how she explained it. Um, so there's a lot of oral traditions in the Navajo culture concerning skinwalkers and how they were sort of used as a last ditch kind of tool of desperation and, 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 partially revenge um when when they were wronged um to to kind of unleash one on an area um again right i, I i'm i as a journalist, I have to kind of, you know, weigh the evidence I have versus the evidence I don't. But I guess all it really showed me was there's a lot of convoluted information and it's very, very chaotic uh, as to kind of what the true story is. Um, and and it, it's it's interesting. That's for sure. Yeah, it absolutely is interesting. And I just I just find this whole thing fascinating. Uh, you know, in the article, you were describing the ranch as you were leaving and you said that it does seem to have an aura. Uh, and even Winterton, he, he said it's like the ranch calls you. Yeah. And, you know, when I read that, it kind of, I kind of sat back and I just was like, huh, because I've heard that it's almost like people describe it as when you're in that area and you leave, it's almost like you leave a piece of you there. Like, like it just has something where it's like, almost, I don't know if it's pulling on your heart or what, but when you were leaving there, did you have this, like, just feel that, you know, it's like, you don't want to go yet. Almost like you just leaving part of you there and you're going to come back later and get it, you know? Yeah. Oh, for sure. When, when I left, I was actually really disappointed. Um, I wanted to stay. Um, I really wanted to, to explore more. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know how to describe it. Right. It, like I said, it's, it's a beautiful place. Um, you know, I could easily stay there for a long time. Um, and there's only so much you can go see in a short amount of time because of how big it is. Um, you know, if I had a week there, you know, I could really kind of be in every little nook and cranny of that place. Um, but you know, with, with only a few days, you're, you're, there's only so much, right? Um, so yeah, I, I did. I think I did leave a piece of myself there. Um, I have, I have, 
you know, if I was invited back, I would go in a heartbeat. Yeah, I, I that's like that's the feeling that I got when I was reading it. It seemed like you would go back in a heartbeat. Is there any chance that you would be invited back? I mean, is there still like an open line of communication between you and the owner? Yeah, yeah, we 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 do uh, we do speak. Um, you know, uh, I, I kind of try to keep tabs on on what's going on um, on the ranch. Um, you know, if there's any potential follow up stories. Um, so yeah, for sure, um, we're always kind of engaging in in in, in communication. Um, you know, I, I hope that that there are other opportunities i hope that um as you know stuff starts to come out concerning the ranch uh, which it will you know i mean we know the tv show's coming out and and part of that is to um you know allow the public some access um skinwalker ranch has been a place of secrecy for for almost two decades it's you know i think the new ownership is is much more willing to kind of let the public kind of see what's going on um so so as things occur you know obviously i'd love to to you know, tell more stories out of, out of the ranch and, 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 you know, hopefully start maybe breaking down the stigma that, that surrounds it, right. This sort of, for, for a lot of skeptical people, um, that sort of woo woo paranormal stuff that they consider nonsense, you know, let's, let's talk about the evidence they've collected on the ranch. Let's talk about the weird things that occur. You know, maybe we are dealing with something we ought to, to investigate further in a legitimate way. Um, so maybe attempt to destigmatize some of those concepts, um, and, and the evidence coming out of the ranch would, would probably help that. So yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's a journalist's dream. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's a lot of people's dreams. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, I appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, in the article at the end, you were just kind of describing what this, you know, ranch is to different groups of people and stuff. And for you, you said, for me, a journalist, it's a story I will someday tell my kids around a campfire. And I think that kind of perfectly describes what it means to you at this point, where it's just like, even if you never go back, it gave you one hell of a story to tell your kids, you know? Yeah, it's um, my 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 wife jokingly, uh, you know, told my daughter she's four. So she kind of understands stuff a little more. Um, you know, my you know, I told them I, you know, I had to go away for a few days. I was going to go on an airplane. I was going somewhere. And my daughter's like, oh, like, you know, what what are you going to go do? And my when my wife kind of just pipes up, she's like, he's going to chase nightmares. <laughs> and I was like, that's a sweet <laughs> that's a sweet way of telling her something. You know, you're like, OK, I'm going to go chase nightmares now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it kind of is the truth. So you didn't you didn't lie to the kids. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> MJ, real quick, before we get out of here, uh, if you could let the people know where they can find you, find your work and uh, again, where to find your book. Thanks very much. Yeah, the plug. I love it. Um, my website is really easy. It's mjbenias.com. Uh, through there, you can read sort of my blog. You can. I have a, I have a YouTube channel that's kind of defunct, but <laughs> uh, maybe it'll resurrect itself at some point. Um, my, my, all my articles are there, so I have kind of a, a running portfolio uh, for people who want to kind of catch up on my work. Um, my book uh, you can buy on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Book Depository, anywhere books are sold. Um, so the, the copy or the name of the book rather is the UFO people, a curious culture. Um, I'm on Twitter, Facebook. You can follow me there. I'm on social media. So yeah, um, reach out. I I'm, I'm always interested in, in new stories. I'm always interested in people's leads and tips and, and anything they might have. Um, you know, like I, I sort of said in the article, right. Um, I'm, I'm a storyteller. Um, all journalists are so, um, stories are, are what I feed off of. So if, if you've got stories, I'd love to hear them. Awesome, man. And you have an open door anytime you want to come on and talk about an article that you've re recently written, man. This has been a great time. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.